At the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Copenhagen in December 2009, that wonderful man, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, addressed the thousands of protesters and he said to them, they marched in Berlin and the wall fell, they marched in Cape Town and the wall fell, they marched in Copenhagen and we are going to get a deal. But they didn't get a deal in Copenhagen. And Tutu is wrong, for once. They didn't just march in Berlin, they tore the wall down. They didn't just march in Cape Town, they engaged in decades of civil disobedience and even armed struggle. The history of social movement activity suggests that reforms are more likely achieved when sections of a social movement demand more than mere reforms and behave in confrontationist ways. Women in Britain didn't get the vote by asking nicely. They tried that for years and had got nowhere. Then the tactics changed dramatically with the suffragette movement to direct action, refusing to be bound by laws that the women had no part in making. The people of India did not gain independence from Britain without a mass movement of civil disobedience, of non-violent direct action. During second wave feminism, it was the women's liberationists being outrageous on the streets, demanding complete sexual equality that frightened governments into passing reformist legislation such as equal opportunity, anti-discrimination, funding for childcare and so on. African Americans didn't even start to make some progress without the civil rights movement. They defied segregation in practice as well as in rhetoric. Rosa Parks' action on the bus, refusing to move from the whites only section and similar rebellious actions by other brave African Americans, those were the actions that were crucial in achieving a part of Martin Luther King's dream. Achievements of social movements are generally won through defiant postures and activities and the making of extravagant political claims because extremism shifts the spectrum of political debate. By carving out political space for themselves, extremists manoeuvre the, the less extreme proponents of the same progressive viewpoint into an advantageous political position. So those moderates emerge as the voice of compromise and reason between the maddies on one side of the spectrum and the, you know, the conservatives resisting any change at all on the other end of the spectrum. Early last year during the carbon pricing negotiations, I remember Adam Bant saying that it would make the job of Greens as the you know, kind of almost middle of the road negotiators much easier if there were really militant weekly protests saying, we want a $70 a tonne price on carbon, to act as a, as a counterweight to the, you know, the Gina Reinhardts and the Clive Palmer saying they wanted no price at all. He said, progressive reforms from above need a loud and angry social movement from below. And the grassroots climate movement has also helped to keep the Greens honest. And that's another reason why moderate gains are achieved not so much by moderate and respectable means, but by militant and disrespectful activity because of the gingering up effect that this has on the moderates themselves. Extremism helps to keep the moderates more focused on their task of achieving reforms. Uh, certainly, the women's liberationists kept the Femocrats on their toes. Now, moderate sections of a movement often claim and truly believe that the reforming achievements are theirs. But I would argue that it is the extremist claims and militant tactics that frighten governments or corporations or whoever's in power making a decision to give in to the moderates in order to weaken the extremist challenges to buy the revolution off with a shilling. Homosexual law reform is usually attributed to forward-thinking political leaders such as Don Dunstan, but it wouldn't have happened without the militant gay pride protests demanding more than mere 
law reform. Uh, campaigning in the streets, being arrested in large numbers, as at the, the first Mardi Gras march in Sydney in 1978. Uh, brave activists coming out on national television, shocking the audience, shocking the TV stations. Demonstrators publicly confronting psychiatrists who were you know, justifying aversion therapy. The ending of conscription for Vietnam was achieved by the ultimate effect on the Labor Party of draft dodgers, save our son's militancy, by the campaign against the war itself and not just conscription, even by sections of the anti-war movement expressing support for the Viet Cong. These actions shifted public opinion eventually and then shifted Labor Party policy. The Femocrats thought their achievements were theirs, but they only got into the corridors of power because of the movement on the ground that was challenging patriarchy, wanting more than mere reforms that the movement won, significant though these have been. The Aboriginal Tent Embassy from 1972 and the militant movement that sustained it, this was what prompted the first land rights legislation, not the polite petition on Bark a decade earlier and other petitions and peaceful requests. Perhaps the most ex spectacular example in Australia of extremism bringing moderate reforms is the Green Bands movement. Between 1970 and 1975, builders labourers, mostly in New South Wales, insisted on exercising a social responsibility for their own labour. They refused to work on projects that were environmentally damaging or socially irresponsible. For example, they refused to tear down the oldest buildings in the country, in the rocks area of Sydney, and to replace them with the concrete and glass skyscrapers that the developers and the corrupt Askin government thought were a grand idea for the area. They refused to build a car park for the Opera House in the Botanic Gardens, which would have killed the ancient fig trees. They refused to build on Kelly's Bush on the Harbour Foreshore, where Jennings wanted to turn a public reserve into luxury apartments for the super rich. All in all, they prevented $5 billion worth of so-called development at mid-1970s prices. Not only were about 40 individual sites saved, but this extreme action achieved long-term reforms. The power of this extreme movement was acknowledged in the, the metaphors that journalists used to describe the relationship between the, the builders' labourers on the one hand and the resident action groups on national trust that they were supporting on the other. Typically, the union was described as the muscle, or the trust and the resident action groups lacked the teeth that the union had. And they were strong and extreme. And so to avoid green bans in the future, governments at both state and federal level initiated or improved legislation to ensure more socially responsive and ecologically responsible planning and development. The green bans and the public support they generated also transformed the culture of urban planning in line with these reforms. Now, there weren't any green bans the following decade to prevent the damming of the Franklin River but it was still prevented by a different form of militant direct action. The Franklin River was saved in 1983 by the blockades of the work site by protesters chaining themselves to the tractors and so on that had been going on for quite a while. That had drawn public attention to the issue, gained public sympathy and encouraged the new Hawke Federal Labor government to intervene uh, to make the issue its own. Now, an example at the international level of the effectiveness of extremism is the impact of the anti-corporate protests late last century and early this century, the movement that the media often rather inaccurately called the anti-globalisation movement. It's better called the, you know, the anti-corporate movement or the global justice movement, sometimes the anti-capitalist movement. And in particular, this movement's use of the summit hopping tactic, as it was known, blockading the citadels of corporate power, such as meetings of the World Trade Organization and the World Economic Forum. 
Uh, the best known blockade of this movement was the Battle of Seattle, late in 1999 when a meeting of the World Trade Organisation was more or less shut down by huge protests in the streets of Seattle. But that wasn't the first of such events and it wasn't the last. Uh, the summit hopping tactic uh, went on for quite a few years. And the movement didn't just use an extreme tactic, it also mounted an extreme demand to end corporate power. Its principal slogan was human need, not corporate greed. The anti-corporate campaigner Susan George stated in 2000, she said, we are demanding to change the world totally. It's not nothing. It's something no one has ever done in history. It won't happen tomorrow morning, but it can be done. We have to fight and fight again and again until we win altogether. Well, what happened as a result of that extreme demand making and, and extreme form of protest? Well, until 9-11 re-stabilised the capitalist world order, what happened was that a reform movement developed within those transnational corporate institutions, such as the World Bank and World Trade Organisation. And that was in response to what us political scientists coyly termed a legitimation deficit, but is actually better known as a serious public relations problem. Those institutions had valued their regular summits as a form of legitimation for their neoliberal ideologies and practices. They didn't want to have to hold their meetings in high security locations such as Okinawa and Qatar, which they became obliged to do. Qatar isn't even a good place for a football match. They were disconcerted to be confronted by demonstrators contesting the consequences of their decision making. And so for a few years, the World Economic Forum, perhaps rather implausibly, became an advocate of what are called globalisation with a human face. And it did things like inviting the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions to participate in discussions. At its summit here in Melbourne in September 2000, it invited Indian activist Vandana Shiva and ACTU President Sharon Burrow to speak to the delegates. The World Bank under Australian James Wolfenson started to portray itself as an agency dedicated to eliminating world poverty. It conceded that many of its neoliberal policies had exacerbated poverty and it changed the nature of its programs in developing countries. World Bank Chief Economist Joseph Stiglitz stated in 2002, until protesters came along, there was little hope for change and no outlets for complaint. It is the trade unionist students and environmentalists, ordinary citizens marching in the streets of Prague, Seattle, Washington and Genoa who have put the need for reform on the agenda of the developed world. European governments started to respond to anti-capitalist, anti-corporate protests with, with talk of the Tobin tax, a tax on international financial transactions. And those reformist initiatives only started to happen because extremism in rhetoric and action threatened the legitimacy of unreformed corporate globalisation. On 23rd of July 2001, the meeting of the G8 in Genoa issued a press release which deplored the anti-corporate protests that were surrounding it, but it also pledged to do more to ensure that the world's poor shared in the benefits of globalisation. And I'm absolutely certain that without the protests to deplore, there would not also have been promises to the poor. Without anti-corporate utopians to destable transnational corporate institutions and unsettle their proponents, there would have been no reform movement. If 9-11 hadn't temporarily come to the rescue of corporate globalisation, more might have been achieved. In a brief space of time, the anti-corporate movement showed that reforms are indeed more likely to be achieved when a social movement demands a very different future, especially if such utopianism is expressed in actively confrontationist ways. Most recently of all, we've seen the explosion on the world scene of the Occupy movement. The common theme expressed by this movement is we are the 99%. And that slogan 
has focused world attention on the grotesque proportions, to slightly varying degrees from one country to the next, of wealth and income enjoyed by just 1 per cent of populations. Occupy Wall Street, that started on the 17th of September last year, describes itself as a leaderless people power movement for democracy that vows to end the moneyed corruption of our democracy and remove the influence money has over policy. Occupy Wall Street publicised, drew attention to what had been going on in the United States over the previous few decades, the way it as a whole society had become significantly less equal than previously. They advertised, for instance, the fact that in 1980, back in 1980, the richest 1% of Americans had only received 10% of national income. Hard times for them. But by 2007, the richest 1% were receiving 23.5% of all income and holding 39 point something or other, nearly 40% of national wealth, because wealth inequalities are even more unequal than income inequalities. And that Occupy movement then went global, went viral uh, on the 15th of October and camps were erected in, in hundreds and hundreds of sites all around the world. And everywhere in these camps, they took over symbolic public space, often financial centres, to protest increasing inequality, corrupt politicians, and the way they felt that economies are rigged to benefit a wealthy few at the expense of everyone else. The first declaration of Occupy Melbourne stated, and this is just an extract, in the name of freedom and democracy, we stand resolutely in opposition to unjust, unrepresentative and unsustainable systems and practices worldwide. We seek to create a just and equitable society in which political and economic power is not concentrated in the hands of a small minority. We seek broad social change and aspire to end all forms of exploitation, oppression and marginalisation. We envision an economic and financial system that is sustainable, democratic and just. We believe this requires fundamental changes to the current system and to structures of state and corporate power. We believe that there is nothing more powerful than an engaged people inspired by the vision of a better future. Our vision is of a world in which all human beings have the opportunity to flourish peacefully within the ecological limits of our planet. To realise this vision, we occupy Melbourne and through this declaration invite people to join us. Now this Occupy movement around the world has refocused public attention on the ugliness of extreme wealth. And this is a welcome change from the rhetoric of what we had for a couple of decades with what has been called the culture wars. Uh, that was a period in which, as uh, Sean Scalmer has observed, the term elite was used to describe the lover of a latte, not the servant of mammon. So what will Occupy achieve? Well, we don't yet know. It's early days yet. but. The debate about the immense social and political problems caused by increased inequality has at last commenced. And there are already some practical developments growing out of the movement on the ground. For example, the Occupy movement in the United States has progressed into an Occupy Homes movement to liberate homes repossessed by banks. And the concept of Occupy has started to provide social scientific critique with academic conference panels sporting titles such as Occupy Consciousness, Occupy Earth, Occupy the Legal System and so on. And it's interesting that thanks to this strong and militant movement that critiquing inequality has again become fashionable in academic circles, which it hasn't been for some time. So Occupy at the very, very least has a critical legacy. Now the title of my talk has obviously been a play on Oscar Wilde, with whose wise words I'd like to end. Not from the importance of being earnest, but from his wonderful essay, The Soul of Man Under Socialism. 
What is said by great employers of labour against agitators is unquestionably true. Agitators are a set of interfering, meddling people who come down to some perfectly contented class of the community and sow the seeds of discontent amongst them. That is the reason why agitators are so absolutely necessary. Without them, there would be no advance towards civilisation. Thank you.